Hi guys, welcome to your very first lesson in flipped pre-calculus. Uh, our first lesson today is on sets of real numbers. This is section 1.1 in our textbook. We have two main objectives for today, and that's to be able to classify real numbers, as well as to use something called interval notation. All right, so I know that you've already actually classified real numbers in your previous 90s course. Now the reason why we're covering it again is because it's very fundamental to understanding what we're going to be doing in pre-calc this year. You need to be able to classify a real number very quickly um, because a lot of times the directions will ask you to, to specify your answer within a certain set of numbers. So even though you've learned these different classifications and these different sets before, we're just going to briefly review it now. So a real number is any number that can be expressed in decimal form. So it's any number that can be found on the number line. So if it's a real number, you can draw it on a, on a basic number line. Okay, That means something like 0. .0006523. That is a real number. Okay. Now, um, here we've got two different representations um, with diagrams to show you the classifications of real numbers. So here we're missing on the right diagram here. We don't have this complex and imaginary. We're only focusing on real. So this here is, I guess, in more detail, this uh, diagram here of real numbers. So we've got complex numbers, which can be broken down into an imaginary part and a real part. Now, in this particular section, we're going to be focusing on um, sets of real numbers. So I'm going to go through here and talk about more in length um, this particular classification of numbers. Now our very first definition here is actually a set of numbers that are not real. These are called the imaginary numbers. Um, I'm sure from 90s algebra you remember solving quadratics with non-real solutions. So something like 3i, that is an example of an imaginary number. So I'm just going to follow here with some examples of the different classifications of numbers. Now from here on out we are dealing with real numbers. Um, so our very first set of real numbers are referred to as the natural or the counting numbers. Okay. So think of the natural numbers as all the numbers that you count with. When you count, you start with 1, 2, 3. Think of when you're a little kid and you start learning how to count. People don't usually say 0, 1, 2, 3. They start with 1. So that's basically one of the first and earliest sets of numbers. This is like before people had a concept of what 0 was, they started counting by 1, 2, 3, and so on. Okay, so counting numbers without 0. Now, finally, somebody got smart and said, well, we have to think of something like to denote nothing. And they thought of, oh, zero. So now we have a whole system of numbers here that start with zero. Okay. So it's your counting numbers with zero. So then people got a little bit more advanced and there was a need to express something, a negative quantity. Probably, you know, when somebody owed someone else, um, I don't know, chickens, because they probably didn't have money at the time, but you know, they owed somebody uh, a debt. So they came up with uh, a little bit more advanced number system that included negative numbers and whole numbers, and we call those integers. So those would be numbers like negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. A rational number is any number that can be expressed as a ratio of two integers. Okay, so a formal um, example here would be something like p over q. If we let both p and q be integers, so if we let p and q be integers, and q is not equal to zero, because if q was equal to zero, we would be dividing by zero. Um, I don't particularly like this example because I don't think it's very concrete for you, so let's list a couple examples here of, an, of a rational number. Something like 3 fifths or even 0.4. Both of these are rational numbers. They can be written as a ratio of two integers. Even something like the number 2. That can be written as the ratio 2 over 1. So these are some examples of rational numbers. All right, now an irrational number is a non-repeating and non-terminating decimal. Let me make some more room here. We kind of ran out of room. Okay, so a number like the square root of 2. This is an irrational number. It is non-repeating and it is a non-terminating decimal. So this is approximately 1.4142, I think it is, or something, something like that. But this goes on forever and forever. It is an irrational number. We cannot rewrite this as a ratio of two different integers. So we call this an irrational number. And finally, we have transcendental numbers. Um, your book refers to this as a transcendental number every once in a while. But it is also an irrational number that is represented with a symbol. So something like pi or e. These are um, both examples of transcendental numbers. 
Now I just want to come back up here and give you the abbreviations for these different sets of numbers because it would be a pain in the butt to always write, especially in proofs, you know, let Q be a natural number or whatever. So we use abbreviations. Um, so these represent the number sets. For example, the natural numbers, um, you will see just a capital N. Sometimes you see this like fancy N and I can't even really do it. It's like a double bar here. Um, I don't know, it kind of looks like that. Now for whole numbers, same thing, you might see a little fancy W, but I suck at it. So, okay, that kind of looks okay. But um, whole numbers use a W. For integers, it kind of switches it up a little bit. We use a Z. Okay, so integers um, are denoted with a capital Z. And rational numbers with a Q. Okay, the reason why it's Q and not R is because it stands for quotient. Think about irrational numbers. Oh, I spelled that wrong. Rational numbers, um, you know, are the quotient of two integers, so that's why we use Q for quotient, or at least that's the way I remember it. All right, then um, for reals, this is a fancy R also. Um, this one's kind of nice because it's just for R, but usually you see a little double bar as well. Now, irrationals have no symbol. It's kind of weird. There is no symbol to represent irrational numbers. You might think it's I, but actually imaginary numbers are uh, denoted with a capital I. Okay, so let's try a couple examples now um, where we're going to name the different number sets that each number belongs to. So there may be more than one. So try to list as many numbers, uh, I'm sorry, try to list as many classifications for each of these numbers as you possibly can. So what I would normally do is probably go through a couple examples with you and then have you do, like pause the video and then try the rest of them on your own. But since we're in class together, I would like you guys to um, do them together with a partner. Now. Please don't make this awkward, like talk to each other, talk to me even, because it's a really awkward day the first day. I hate the first day. So go ahead, um, I'll pause the video, and then you guys will try one through six. All right, so now we move on to interval notation. Um, so this is brand new for you guys. I know you have never used interval notation before, but basically all that it is is a method used to define a set of numbers. So we, we just define different classifications of sets of real numbers. Now we're gonna use interval notation when we wanna describe a certain set of numbers. So usually interval notation is used to describe a certain span or a group of spans of numbers along an x axis. Well any axis, but typically it's the x-axis. Um, this notation, though, can be used to describe any group of numbers, okay? So let's take a look at each of these diagrams here and then consider the different sets of numbers that are being shown. So here um, in this diagram, our old method for interpreting this range of numbers or this set of numbers here would be to use an inequality, right? We would use an, an inequality to describe this and we would place negative one here with an open bracket, I'm sorry, a, a less than symbol here, x and then less than or equal to two. This here, this inequality would denote all real numbers between negative one and two. Negative one having an open circle, which means it's not included, right? x cannot equal negative one, but x can equal two because this is included, all right? Now, our new way of rewriting this is slightly easier. I think it's a little bit cleaner looking, um, and that's interval notation. So with interval notation, we used we use brackets and parentheses, okay? So a parenthesis is used whenever you have an open circle. So we would have an open um, parenthesis here and negative one placed next to it. We would write comma, then two and a closed bracket. So this is actually equivalent to this inequality here. So the parenthesis represents an open circle a bracket represents a closed circle, okay? So this is saying all real numbers between negative one and two, negative one is not included, two is included, okay? Now for the diagram, it's a little bit different here as well. So let me write negative one and two here. We would have a parenthesis and then a bracket placed here and then we would just shade in between. So often I don't see a lot of um, diagrams like this but I do know your book uses this sometimes, so be familiar with either of those two types of diagrams, okay? Okay, now at this point, I would like you to pause the video, and I want you to try um, for this particular diagram, rewriting it as an inequality, and then using interval notation, and then drawing a diagram using inter interval notation as well. So we'll pause, and then we'll talk about your answers as a class. Okay, a couple more vocabulary terms, and then we're going to get into some more practice problems here. Um, but an open interval is an interval that does not include its endpoints. So as you can see here, 
we have two parentheses. This is interval notation here, parentheses on the A, parentheses on a B. These are both real numbers not included within the interval. So this would be a particular diagram here of an open interval. So we would rewrite that as negative one to two with two open brackets, or two open parentheses, I should say. Now a closed interval includes both its endpoints. So we have closed brackets here. Um, and then of course we would rewrite this in interval notation. Um, as the closed interval, negative 1 to 2. All right, next up we're going to talk about unbounded intervals. So this is an interval that continues without bound in a certain direction. Now our goal is to graph the interval on a number line and then rewrite it in inequality notation instead of interval notation. So in example 1 here, we're looking at an interval um, from negative infinity to 5. So this is saying all real numbers from negative infinity to 5. Well, notice that on negative infinity here we have an open parenthesis. And that's because negative infinity, that's not an actual number. You can't include that in your interval, so we use an open uh, parenthesis always whenever we're dealing with infinity. Okay, so you can see that over here too, it's an open parenthesis. Now, like I said, infinity is not an actual number, it's just an idea. It continues forever and forever, you know, in the neg it's unbounded to the negative direction, but it is not an actual number. So when we go to graph this, we can't actually show it stopping on negative infinity. All we're going to do is have a 5 here. We'll have a bracket on the 5. And we'll show all numbers less than or equal to 5. So that kind of indicates what your actual um, inequality would be. We would write that as x is less than or equal to 5. So all of these are the same um, meaning. They represent the same set of numbers. Now in example 2, if we wanted to show all numbers between 3 and infinity, once again you see that you have an open parenthesis here. We also have an open parenthesis on the 3 though, so that is not included, which means we would have parenthesis on the 3 shaded to the right, denoting all numbers greater than or, e or I'm sorry, just greater than 3. So this is x is strictly greater than 3. Now I'm just going to go back and make sure that uh, you also have it drawn in as just a normal um, number line without the interval notation on there just because um, like I said not all books use that so I just want to make sure that you're familiar with <laughs> drawing in a normal number line I know that you can do that but there you go alright now we also might have more than one interval um, when we're dealing with a, a diagram like in examples 4 and 5 here you can clearly see we have two different intervals in this um, in each diagram here but in example 3 we're just given a statement okay we have x is less than negative 1 or x is greater than or equal to 2 these are actually two unique intervals right um, we actually just did the exact opposite here in the problem above we took an interval and we rewrote it in inequality notation now we have an inequality and we want to rewrite it using interval notation so this is an unbounded interval okay so if we want to write x is less than negative 1 that means that it's unbounded in the negative direction, right? So we would have negative infinity with an open parenthesis to negative 1 with an open parenthesis. Now let's rewrite our second um, interval here. This is greater than or equal to 2, so that means 2 is included. So we're going to positive infinity, which means um, it's going to be unbounded in the positive direction. And we would write that interval as such. So we have a closed bracket on the 2 open parenthesis on the uh, infinity symbol. Now, this word or here, okay, is indicating that the number can fall either within this interval or this interval, right? So if we wanted to show that a number is going to fall within anywhere within there, we need to somehow put these two intervals together. The way you do that is using a u for union, okay? So this is the union of two different intervals. Now, in example 4, I think it's a little bit easier actually than example 3 because we have a diagram. So here it's a little bit easier to write our interval because we can just simply steal that closed bracket here. We're going from negative 6 to 0, so 0 is not included. And then we're going to join that with the unbounded interval from 3 to positive infinity. So again, we have an open parenthesis here, um, and on the infinity here, an open parenthesis. Now, in example 5, um, this is kind of odd, okay? Uh, we have an unbounded, uh, you know, uh, we have two separate unbounded intervals. And uh, the fact that we have an open uh, parenthesis here on the negative 5 means we're looking at all real numbers except negative 5, okay? So 
x can be any real number except negative 5. If we wanted to rewrite this at an interval notation, we have to write it as an unbounded interval from negative infinity to negative 5, open parenthesis, join that with another um, unbounded interval here from negative 5 to positive infinity. So this is how we would represent this in um, interval notation. All right, that's the end of your very first lesson in 90s pre-calc. Nice job. Uh, let's make sure we ask good questions and get our homework done.